Hi, my name is Lorenzo Gomez, and I want to thank you all once again for inviting me to be one of your speakers uh, for today's event. Um, I'm so excited to bring you a message that comes from my first book, The Cilantro Diaries, and share some of the lessons that I've learned from there. So let me go ahead and uh, share my screen with you. And uh, I want to show you a presentation that is based on a book. Um, the title of this presentation is My Best Advice to You, and this is sort of a lot of the pain and a lot of the successes that I've learned the hard way, and I want to share them with you ahead of time so that you can use them um, as you start the next phase of your journey and uh, do a lot more things a lot faster than I did. So before I do that, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. My name again is Lorenzo Gomez, and I'm a native San Antonian, um, grew up big Hispanic family. There's seven kids in my family. I'm the sixth of seven. I uh, grew up um, right off I-10 and uh, uh, West Avenue. And so I uh, grew up in San Antonio. And uh, when I started working, I was really fortunate enough to do some really cool jobs, which I'm going to tell you about a little bit later. But most recently, I've been in the tech scene for the last uh, probably 15 years. Um, I started at Rackspace when I was 20 years old, which I'll tell you a little bit more about. And then after I left Rackspace, I was uh, I started and co-founded the 8020 Foundation, which is a, a philanthropic nonprofit um, that does grants to charities in San Antonio. I was also CEO and I'm now chairman of Geekdom, which is a collaborative co-working space. It's actually where I'm recording this video right now in downtown San Antonio. And then most recently, um, some friends of mine uh, founded a nonprofit called Tech Block, which is really doing tech advocacy for the city. So. Uh, I want to jump right into my presentation. So I'd like to start this out with what I call the great lie. And the great lie that I think that we, that we perpetuate in the world, and especially guys in the tech world like me do a bad job, is this notion that if you see anybody on the news or the media that's super successful, anybody like Steve Jobs or Mark Zuckerberg, it's this notion that, all, that these guys were so superhuman that they did everything by themselves. And I want to submit to you today that that's, the, that's not the whole story, that there's more to that story. And the story is, is that no man and no woman is an island. And if you think about the person that you admire the most, whether it be your parents, whether it be a business person or a celebrity, and we were to pull the curtain back on their life, I guarantee you that they had a team. They had people around them, uh, maybe it was a teacher, a counselor, a pastor, a priest, um, their husband or wife, but they all had someone in their corner to help them uh, get to the, where they got to today. And so I wanna break, down, break that down for you a little bit. So I wanna talk about some famous teams that there are in the world. The most famous team that I've ever uh, run across is Jesus and the 12 disciples. And when you read the Old Testament or even the New Testament, you, know, you see that everybody, everybody had a group of counselors uh, that they went with, and Jesus was no exception, so he had 12 disciples. I call it his posse. Um, the other famous team that I really love, because I'm a, I'm a movie guy, is The Godfather, and for those of you that haven't seen The Godfather, it is a, it's a mafia movie. It's about this really, you know, uh, a bad, you know, a guy who has people, you know, uh, he, he, he runs, you know, uh, gambling and all kinds of things, and The Godfather had a group of counselors, but his most important counselor was a guy named Tom Higgins, who's in the back of this picture. And he was the consigliere, he was the counselor to the dawn. And I thought one day after watching the movie, I said, you know, when the Godfather and Jesus have something in common, it just has to be true, right? Whenever you're like an underboss of an organized crime and you're, you know, uh, the Christ and you have it in common, just know that, uh, pay attention, that they all had teams, right? And so I wanna tell you this principle that I've learned, that I've gleaned from my years in, the, in corporate America and beyond, and it's this notion that everybody needs a personal board of directors. And if you forget everything I say today, I want you to, to latch on to this one phrase right here. Uh, everybody needs a personal board of directors, and I'm gonna show you what that means here in a second. So I wanna talk about Rackspace briefly. I'm gonna tell you more about it later. But when I started working at Rackspace, I was a real young man, uh, I was 20 years old. I didn't have any college degree. Um, I had never worked in a tech company before. And I remember that every month, our CEO, who's the guy on the right, Lanham Napier, and our chairman, uh, who's the guy on the left, Graham Weston, would do this really awesome thing called the open book meeting. And what they would do every month is they would get the entire company in a room and they would put on a projector, on a PowerPoint, all of the financials of the company. Everything we spent, everything we brought in, 
Um, and it was just so am amazing as a 20 year old to see what I thought was this top secret information. And it really, really blew my mind. And one day, Lanham and Graham were talking and they said something that I had never heard before. They said something about the Rackspace board of directors. And when they said it, I feel like everything about them changed. I feel like they got a little quieter. And in my movie head, in, my, in the movie version in my head, the lights went dim and prayer candles came out. And they said, we need to present this to the board of directors. And so I leaned over to the guy next to me and I said, hey, what is a board of directors? And the guy next to me said, well, somewhere out there, Lorenzo, is about 10 men and women. And their job is to give leadership and counsel and guidance to the CEO. And they're the only people that have the authority to hire and fire the CEO or decide if you sell the company or not. And I thought to myself, let me get this straight. These guys, who I already thought were the smartest dudes I had ever met, one went to Harvard, one was an A&M grad that had, had a bunch of successful businesses. These guys that I already thought were the smartest guys had other people they went to for counsel and advice. And this guy said, yeah, that's right. And I thought, that's amazing. And as the guy kept describing what the board of directors did, I stopped listening because all I can imagine in my head was the Jedi Council from Star Wars. And I thought everybody in that room had to have like, you know, Yoda style, you know, wisdom. Or if you're a Tolkien fan, it's the Council of Elrond. So everybody had to have a Gandalf bushy beard and a, and a Gandalf hat. And it really blew my mind. And I think the reason it did was because I was convinced as a young man that the boss had to have all the answers or to pretend to have all the answers. And here was a group of guys that I admired that openly talked about them going to get advice from other people. And I want you to, to, to remember that. So I wanna tell you my story really quickly. Um, and this is a story about how I accidentally stumbled upon a personal board of directors. And I wanna tell it to you so that you don't stumble upon it, that you do it proactively uh, because if you do it proactively, you'll accomplish 10 times more than I ever could in my career. And that's my hope for you. So um, my first official job where I sort of paid taxes was working for a grocery store that, that many of you may never heard of, have heard of called Handy Andy. But before I worked at Handy Andy, my first unofficial job was working with my father. My father um, was an x-ray technician his whole life, but he's from Laredo. And, uh, and on the side, when he wasn't working, we would, he would build houses. Um, and, so, and then we would rent them. And so my three brothers and I, every weekend, every summer, every holiday, um, when most people were doing vacation, we were out there building houses. And I have to tell you, I hated every second of it. Uh, I hated sheetrocking and digging holes. And these are very soft hands. And so I was destined to be a computer guy. And so uh, one day, my brother, my oldest brother, Danny, said, hey, man, if you don't want to dig another hole, uh, you better get a J-O-B as soon as you turn 16. And I was like, word, bro. And so as soon as I turned 16, I applied everywhere and nobody would hire me. And uh, I applied at McDonald's, at Burger King, at Pizza Hut, and just nobody would even call me back. And I was getting very discouraged. And my mother came up with a great idea one day, as all mothers do. And she said, you know what, Lorenzo, your brother Hector worked at this grocery store, Handy Andy, and they loved him. Uh, why don't you have him give them a call and see if they'll give you an interview? So my brother Hector called the Handy Andy and they agreed to give me an interview. And so I went in for the interview. I had never done an interview before. I'd never done a job interview. I didn't have a resume. Nobody taught me how to do that. And so I brought in all of my report cards and all of my perfect attendance awards. And none of that mattered because the moment I got in there, the manager was this really nice guy named Mr. Diaz. And he came out from behind the office and uh, he gave me an interview. And I'm going to reenact it for you right now because it was super quick. He walked up to me. He looked me up and down and he said, so you're Hector Gomez's brother, huh? Yes, sir. Do you work hard like your brother? Yes, sir. Okay, you're hired. You start in two weeks. And just like that, I had a principal just dropped on my lap that I learned that day, which I want to share with you, which is it's not what you know, it's who you know. And this is a very, very interesting principle because what it really means is it's about relationships. So the question I want to ask you is, do you have good relationships? Um, what you know is important after the who. Having and maintaining good relationships is one of the most important things that nobody ever tells you about. My brother Hector, he had a currency that was so high in his reputation that I was able to trade on it. And so a lot of you uh, that are watching right now come from a similar background than I did. I didn't have any money. I didn't have any connections. I didn't have any business relationships. I didn't have any skills. I had nothing that the business world valued. 
And so I was just an unknown guy. And so if you have that type of background, just know that like my brother, the first thing you have is your reputation. And so the question I have for you is, are you the kind of person that someone will put their reputation on the line for? My brother Hector put his reputation on the line for me and I was able to get a job because his reputation was so high, right? And so one day, right, you're gonna have to ask someone to vouch for you. The question for you is, are you vouchable? Are you the kind of person that someone wants to gladly put their name on the line for? Because uh, I mean, if not, you have some work to do. The other thing I wanna tell you, um, especially the, those of you that are watching are special, you're in a special group. And one day someone's gonna ask you, is so-and-so next to you worth vouching for? Should we hire the person next to you? And that is a very important question that you need to answer. Because if they're not worth it, you shouldn't vouch for them. My brother vouched for me because he thought I was worthy. And if I had performed badly, and if I'd have been a terrible employee, I would have ruined my brother's reputation. And so it's not what you know, it's who you know. So you need to start and, and, and prune and garden your relationships um, with, with the most intensity that you can. So I'm working at uh, Handy Andy um, and I'm loving life. I'm at a, I'm, so I'm working at this grocery store. But if you're from San Antonio like I am, there is only one Nordstrom. There's only one Lexus in the grocery store world. And the highest, best, awesomest grocery store in the whole world is H-E-B. And so I wanted to work at H-E-B so badly, uh, but I couldn't. I was working at Handy Andy because I couldn't get a job at H-E-B. So one day, my sister Sonia got me an interview because she was working at H-E-B. And specifically, this H-E-B that you see right here is in the Deco District, it's West Avenue in uh, Fredericksburg. And everyone in my family, uh, all of my siblings worked at this H-E-B. It's called H-E-B number five. Um, all of us worked there except my little sister. And so I wanted to continue the Gomez tradition of working at H-E-B number five. And so my sister got me an interview. I got, a, I got the job. I started as a bagger. I was promoted to checker. And then I got the huge biggest promotion there was for me, which was I started working in the produce department. And I loved working in the produce department. And I got to tell everybody watching right now that uh, nobody could stack jalapenos or lettuce faster than this guy right here. I was the fastest that there ever was. And I loved it. I was having so much fun. And then one day I got a phone call from one of my personal board of directors. I didn't know he was on my board of directors at the time, um, but he was my best friend. His name is Dax Moreno. And Dax and I met when we were 15 years old on the school bus on the way to school. And when I met Dax, I was immediately struck by how smart he was, by how articulate he was. Uh, you know, he, he read a lot, which was new for me. And I wanted to be his friends. So we became friends. And so Dax and I graduated from Health Careers High School. Um, I was working at HEB number five. He was working at another HEB. And one day he called me and he said, hey man, I left HEB. I'm now working at a computer store that you've never heard of. And I'm the youngest sales guy there. And I'm learning so much and I'm just crushing it. And my boss asked me this question. He said, Does, do you have any friends that work hard like you? And he said, I have one friend named Lorenzo. And he said, I, I want you to quit produce and go work in this computer store. And I said, I, and I was on the phone and I said, Dax, that's the stupidest, dumbest idea I've ever heard in my entire life. And I said, there's no future in computers. I mean, who's ever heard of working in computers? That's so silly. You know, I, do you have any idea how fresh the cilantro is this season? I'm not just going to give that up to go work with computers. And he was like, oh, come on, man. So I hung up the phone. I said, no. But the reason Dax is on my personal board of directors is for what he did next. Dax saw my potential and he would not give it up. So for about two weeks straight, Dax called me every day and he said, hey, you're missing this huge opportunity. You need to come work at this computer store. And then finally he changed his pitch and he said, you know, it's a 25 cent raise, right? And I was like, whoa, that's big cash. And so I decided to take the leap. I quit HEB and I went to go work at this computer store uh, that I had never heard of called Gateway Computers. And if any of you out there have bought or, or in the past bought a gateway computer from the store in San Antonio, I just want to apologize because if I was your sales guy, I know I didn't sell you a warranty and I'm sorry because I should have sold you a warranty. And so I started working at this place called Gateway. I'd never heard of it. And the, the most amazing thing happened. I started learning about computers. Um, I thought it was really cool. I was the lowest guy on the totem pole there. I was like the, the guy who just took your name on the clipboard and would clean all the displays. But I was getting a chance to learn about computers. 
And so one day this guy came up to me. He said, hey, Lorenzo, you need to learn about what we do here. So I'm going to take apart his computer and teach you. So he took apart his computer and he said, that thing right there is your hard drive. It's like the closet in your house. It's where you store all your information. Uh, this thing right here is your processor. It's like the engine in your car. And he was explaining it all. And I thought, oh my God, I'm a hacker right now. Like I'm so smart with computers. And then he said, hey, we need to register uh, an email address for you. And I said, what's an email address? And he was like, oh man, this guy's, this guy's way, way old school. And so they registered my lgomez123 at hotmail.com email address, which is still active. Um, if you want to email it, you can. And so I was learning about computers and I just thought it was the coolest time ever. And while I was there, I met another really amazing guy named James Brem. And James had moved down to San Antonio from Sioux City, Iowa, which is where Gateway's headquarters was. And James had left Gateway and he was at work another company. And he called me one day and James said, hey man, I'm at this crazy company. Uh, downtown that you've never heard of. It's a crazy startup. Uh, it'll probably run out of money, but it's super cool. It's super exciting. And they buy us whatever we want for food like every other day. And it's called Rackspace. And he goes, I want you to, I want you to come join. Uh, I want you to come interview for account manager. And I thought, man, I don't know. And so I Googled Rackspace and I looked up what they did. They did managed hosting, something called managed hosting, which I had no idea what that was. It's still very hard to explain to my mom. It's basically the plumbing of the internet. But I didn't know that at the time. And so I went in for this interview. Uh, the interview went well. And then they sent me a job offer for, uh, I believe it was $25,000 uh, salary. And I thought, oh my God, this is the biggest amount of cash I've ever seen in my life. And so I got the offer letter and then I got scared. And I almost didn't take the offer. And the reason I almost didn't take the offer was that I was very insecure about feeling stupid. I thought to myself, I don't really know what this company does. And, I, and maybe they've made a mistake by hiring me. And I'm going to go to work and I'm going to get on the phone and they're going to hear me and they're going to say, hey, that guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Walk him out the building, fire him right now. And I had this story in my head that I was stupid and that I didn't know what I was doing. And because of that story, I told myself, I almost turned the job down. But luckily for me, I had another person on my personal board of directors. And it's my oldest brother, Danny. And my oldest brother, Danny, is, is, is my, one of my best friends. Um, we've been close ever since I was little. And he really does love me, even though in this picture, it looks like he's trying to stab me in the brain with a pencil. And so Danny is, I would call the chairman of my board. He's always been so wise and given me such good counsel. And so I went to him and I said, hey, man. I think I'm gonna turn this job down. And he said, slow down. He said, let me ask you some questions. The first one is, do you think you're gonna learn a lot of stuff? And I was like, yeah, I don't even know what they do. So whatever I learn is gonna be you know, more than what I know. And he said, okay, well, that's, that's important. He said, do you think there'll be anybody that you can learn from? Anybody that you can uh, befriend that knows more than you, that can help coach you and teach you? And I said, yeah, I said, everybody there knows more than me. And he said, well, honestly, man, I think you should give it a shot. I don't think, I think that those are good enough reasons to at least try it. And he goes, and he said, what happens if, if it doesn't work out? You go back to H-E-B, you go back to Gateway, they loved you there. He goes, but, but give it a shot. And so I, thanks to his help and his encouragement, I took the leap and joined uh, Rackspace. And, it, and it's no exaggeration to say it changed my life. And I want to pause there and just say, who are the people in your life like him? Who are the people that see your potential and encourage you? Because those are the people that you need to surround yourself with. Are there people in your life that tell you that you are stupid, that tell you that you're might not good enough? You need to dump those people and replace them with an army of Danny's. Okay. So I get hired at Rackspace. I'm loving life. I'm learning a lot. And one day my boss comes up to me and she says, Lorenzo, we have an office in Great Britain in London. And there's one account manager there and she's going on vacation. And so we need to send someone from the U.S. to go cover all of those accounts and train the new account manager that they're hiring. And they, and she said, hey, you're the guy. But in my head, I heard a different story. In my head, I heard, and you're the only loser with no girlfriend and no wife and no kids and no dog and no house. And so we're sending you. And so I was really excited, but I was also very scared. I'd only been on a plane once up until that time with my brother to Vegas. And so I was really afraid of traveling internationally. I didn't know how to travel internationally. And so I almost didn't go, but luckily I, it worked out. So I go to the London office for one month. Uh, my mom was super mad. She didn't want me to go. And, uh, and so I went and it was just amazing. And I did a little bit of travel while I was there. But the most important thing was I sat next to 
the guy who ran the whole office. His name was Dominique Monkhouse. He was the managing director, which is the UK version of the CEO. And going back to the first principle, it's not what you know, it's who you know. He and I had, we just, by sitting next to each other, had a great relationship. We got to know each other and he really liked me. And before I left, he said, Lorenzo, we love having you here so much that we want you to move to the United Kingdom full time and we'll get you a five to seven year work visa. And I said, hey man, that's cool. But no, that's not my, yeah, I'm, I'm good. You know, thanks, but I appreciate it. Uh, but thanks for thinking of me. And so I went home and, uh, and what would happen is uh, every three months, Dom would come to the US for a leadership meeting. And every three months, he would walk by my desk and he would make me the offer again. He said, just so you know, Lorenzo, offer still stands. We'd love for you to come to the US. And I say, no, no, I'm good. Well, one day he came by my desk and, and the woman I shared a cubicle with is a good friend of mine named Jessica Gracia, but she goes by Jake. And so Jake was sitting next to me and she heard it all, it all go down and he leaves and she turns around and my friend Jake here in this picture uh, put the smack down on me. And this is when I knew Jake was on my board of directors, whether, whether she knew it or not. But she turned around, and she said, dude, you're being a big, big idiot. And you are going to miss the opportunity of a lifetime. She says, I know you're afraid, but you need to go move to the UK immediately. She goes, you're going to have amazing experiences that you're never going to get the chance to do ever again. And I know you're afraid of missing out. You're missing out, but let me tell you something. You're going to go there and come back and all your friends are going to be doing the same stuff, talking about the same things at the same bar. She goes, you're not going to miss anything. And I really looked up to Jake. Her and her husband were these really cool people. They would, they would uh, invite me to their house for dinner all the time. And, you know, they read books for a living. They would go to shows and musicals and all these things that I really, I, I aspire to do. And I said, you know what? Jake's making a lot of sense. And I said, you know what? I think I'm going to do it. So I went home and I told my parents, hey, I'm moving to London. And they were really upset. They didn't talk to me for two weeks. And so I moved to the UK. I uh, got a five-year visa. I didn't do five years. I did uh, about two and a half, three years there. And so I moved to the UK and, uh, and it really did change my life again. I had never traveled. I'd never really left the state of Texas. Um, I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, which is this picture you see. It's the tallest mountain in Africa. I went to Spain and I ran with the bulls. My mom didn't talk to me for two weeks after I did that. She was so mad at me. Um, and I just really experienced things that I would never have gotten to experience had I not had a good relationship and had I not had people and mentors that encouraged me and saw my potential. And so what I want to tell you today is this message that you don't need a whole Jedi council. You don't need four or five people like I did. All you need is one. You need one good friend, one good counselor, one good coach, someone who sees your potential. Um, and then you will be ahead of everyone else around you. One person on your personal board of directors is enough. And I want to encourage you with that. This is one of my favorite quotes from my boss, who's also one of my mentors, Graham Weston. He was the owner of Rackspace. And he said, a mentor is someone who believes in your potential. And so I want you to think about the people in your life that see your potential. Those are the people that you need to spend more time with. And I would say, those are the people you need to recruit for your personal board of directors. And just like I met Dax sitting next to me on the bus when I was 15, the person next to you on your left and right could be that person. And so I want to, wherever you are in the world watching this, I want you to turn to the person on your left and right. And I want you to tell them, you might be good enough to be on my personal board of directors. So uh, this lesson of the personal board of directors is taken uh, from my first book called The Cilantro Diaries. I have a second book called Tafoya Toro uh, that came out in 2019. And when I released Cilantro Diaries, I thought my mom was just going to buy 10 copies and it was gonna, that was going to be the end of it. And it turned out it got number one in four categories on Amazon.com. And then it was number one on Audible.com the week that it came out. And so it's done really well. If you want to learn more about these principles, you can uh, pick up the book. And, uh, or you can follow me on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. Uh, anybody here that wants to add me on LinkedIn, I would be happy to have a professional connection uh, with you and uh, shoot me an email if you have any questions more about the book. But thank you so much for having me. And I'm so honored to be a part of your journey. I hope that you'll take the lesson of having a personal board or starting to build a personal board is something that you can put in your toolbox because I promise you, you will do even more than I did if you apply the principles. Thank you so much.